Okay, uh, good evening everybody. If we can go ahead and get started with our program tonight. So uh, thank you for being here and uh, being part of this edition of the Albers Executive Speaker Series. Uh, my name is Joe Phillips. I'm Dean of the Albers School and it's my pleasure to welcome everyone. Uh, this evening we are happy to welcome Ali and Scott Svensson, founders of Mod Pizza. And the title of their presentation is Using Pizza as a Platform for Social Impact. Before introducing our speakers, I would like to ask Father Steve Sundborg, President of Seattle U, to come to the podium. Father? Thank you very much, Joe. And um, I really I wanted to be able to just say a word at the beginning of the Albers Executive Speaker Series, at the beginning of another year. This is just one of the Pride points to Seattle University, really a signature program, kind of the best in class. Um, I remember when it was um, created by, by Joe as the dean, together with the Albers a Dean's Advisory Group many years ago, and it's just been a stellar kind of a program, and it's just one of the very best things that uh, Seattle University does. And usually I brag about what new rankings and ratings the Albert School of Business and Economics and Finance and Accounting and Executive Leadership have received, but I'll leave that to Joe if he wants to do it tonight. I thought I might just say a word about um, who are the Albers. Uh, people refer to this as the Albers School of Business and Economics, and bet many don't know who they were. Well, there was a company called the Albers Brothers Milling Company, which was the largest uh, flour and seed milling company of the West Coast with headquarters in Portland and, and covering the states of California and Oregon and, and Washington and Idaho. And uh, there were brothers that were immigrants from Germany who developed that company and the Seattle brother was named George and he was married to Eva. And they were very close friends of Father Lemieux who was the president of uh, Seattle University. And after George's death, uh, there was a gift to Seattle University, which was a significant gift of that time, which was the origins of naming the Albers School of Business and Economics after George and Eva Albers. And they had just one daughter, and her name was uh, Genevieve. And uh, Genevieve was quite a personality of uh, Seattle, and we all got to know her so well over many, many, many years, and she was the sole heir of George and Eva. And I was always impressed that in her will, became known after her death that she gave half of her estate for the poor and half of her estate for education. And uh, Seattle University was the recipient of a significant part of that estate for Catholic education. And uh, I just think it's worthwhile, particularly as we've celebrated 125 years of Seattle University's history, to remember those who have been so generous and have made our university to be what it is and made this wonderful school, Albert School of Business and Economics, to be what it is. So. Let's just remember um, George and Eva Albers. And I also thought as a Catholic priest in a Catholic university, it might be important for us just to stop for a moment because of the extraordinary disasters and violence that we've experienced uh, both in our country and in our continent in the last just couple of weeks and just hold in our hearts for a moment those who have been devastated or killed or wounded or hurt and uh, pray for them in our own way. Amen. Back to you, Joe. Thank you, Father. And I hope everybody knows that uh, this is Father's 21st year as president of Seattle University, and we're using the year to celebrate his 20 years as president. So more to come on that, Father. Um, so before introducing our speakers, let me briefly describe the format so they will make their presentation. And then after that, uh, there'll be a panel of uh, three who I will in introduce to you later who will ask questions, and then we'll go to the audience for some questions. Um, I also want to mention that, you know, this, this, this is the 16th year of the speaker series. We've never had a husband and wife team come to the speaker series, so this is really a historic event, right? Um, so Scott and Ali Svensson are the co-founders of Mod Pizza, as we know, and Mod is a pioneer of fast casual pizza known for its individual artisan-style pizzas and salads and people-first culture. The brand has been named the fastest growing restaurant chain in the U.S. for the last two years and recently was number two in the Puget Sound Business Journal's fastest growing private companies. 
The Swensons are serial entrepreneurs, uh, recently being named the Ernst & Young Entrepreneurs of the Year in the Pacific Northwest. They co-founded Seattle Coffee Company in London in 1994, and in 1998 sold it to Starbucks as their entry into the European market. Scott remained on as president of Starbucks UK and subsequently president of Starbucks Europe, while Ali helped to oversee the transition of the Starbucks co coffee company stores to Starbucks stores. While in the UK, the couple were also instrumental in growing Carluccio's, a thriving London-based operator of Italian del delis and cafes, and with their help, that expanded to over 50 locations in the UK and the Middle East. In 2001, they returned to their hometown of Seattle to raise their family. Their entrepreneurial spirit again kicked in and they began exploring ideas that combined their love of business, people, and purpose. The first mod opened in 2008 in downtown Pizza, and the Pizza with a Purpose brand has grown from there. Today, mod has more than 260 stores across 24 states and the United Kingdom and they have over 5,200 mod squatters, employees. Scott serves as CEO and Allie is protector of the purpose. And let's hear the rest of their story directly from them. Let's please welcome Allie and Scott. Thank you. Okay. Welcome everybody, thanks for joining us. Um, can you guys hear us? Um, so we had we have a little bit of a presentation which we're just going to um, have running in the background. It's more to bring a little bit of flavor and energy of mod uh, while we're uh, sharing a little bit of the story. Joe did such a great job with the introduction that the section of the uh, story that I was going to tell he covered most of the highlights. So um, I'll kind of I'll kind of fill in some of the blanks just to provide some of the history of mod and how we got to where we are today. Uh, and then we'll share a little bit more of, uh, about why we're building the business. Um, so as uh, Joe mentioned, uh, we started Seattle, uh, Seattle Coffee Company in London, and that was our first experience in retail, uh, having my, uh, Ali and I both grew up in Seattle uh, and then went to school uh, outside of Seattle on the East Coast and then ended up uh, in London and uh, spent a, a little bit of time doing various things from publishing and investment banking and private equity. And um, we ended up opening a coffee business. Uh, having grown up in Seattle with Starbucks, uh, we immediately, or Allie, identified when she arrived in London what they were missing, which was a quality coffee experience. And so we had this fabulous experience building a Starbucks-style coffee experience in London, which we then sold to Starbucks, um, and then helped start another business in the UK called Carluccio's with some fabulous uh, individuals, which we built up over 11 years, um, and then eventually sold that business to move back to Seattle. And um, that's the backdrop of our experience in retail, um, which was uh, we were drawn into it to fill a need in the UK, which we were passionate about and which we felt uh, was clearly missing. It wasn't because we were looking to start a business or to specifically start a retail concept. Um, and when we moved back to Seattle, we had uh, two boys at the time. We subsequently ended up with four. And uh, we had uh, identified that there was a, a gap in the market. Interestingly enough, we had done a whole range of things outside of retail. We had decided that we were not going to get back into restaurants or retail because it's a very fickle industry. And we assumed that uh, having had two magical experiences, that if we tried it a third time, we would inevitably screw it up and um, we would taint this great uh, series of memories we had. And uh, it was only when somebody approached us and suggested we look at the pizza industry that we took a hard look at it and we decided that uh, a couple of things. One, it was an enormous industry, $40 billion, that had gone through uh, a shocking lack of innovation over the last 35 years. And at the same time, if you looked at restaurants, there had been all types of innovation, particularly with uh, the fast casual service format. And so the, the very simple insight we had was, what would it look like if we combined the fast casual service format, which is so well designed for today's lifestyle, it's fast, it's high quality, it's great value, and it's aspirational, 
with pizza, which is the second largest food category in restaurants behind hamburgers. Um, and we decided to give it a shot. And so we'd had the benefit of working with some fabulous people during our time at Starbucks. We asked some of them to get involved um, and help us think it through. We opened up a store in downtown Seattle as our laboratory. And uh, over a, a number of years, worked to figure out whether or not this was a concept that would scale. And during that time, we opened three other locations in Seattle with the mantra of trying to fail fast. Um, we had done this before. We knew what we were looking for in terms of the metrics and the, the performance that would indicate that this could scale. Uh, we opened up, in, in addition to downtown Seattle, we opened up on Capitol Hill, we opened up in Bellevue, and in the University District. Uh, and our experience with those first four was very mixed, but not very promising. Um, the one in downtown Seattle did okay, uh, the one in Bellevue did pretty well. The one on, in the University District was very average. And the one on Capitol Hill, we ended up closing. So from those first four, I mean, a lot of people look back and say, man, you must have had enormous success from the beginning to turn out where you've ended up. And, and the reality was we learned a ton of lessons. Um, and we had some insights from those first four, but we, we really didn't know until we opened our fifth, and then we opened the sixth and seventh. And that's when we realized that there was uh, an opportunity, and we started to invest in infrastructure and people, and we went through a period of five years where we said we were going slow so that we could eventually go fast. And um, we did go fast. Over the last four years, we've grown from 14 stores uh, to 265 today. Um, as Joe mentioned, for the last two years, we've been the fastest growing restaurant chain in the US. Um, we've opened up in the UK, where we had uh, had so much experience. Uh, we have tentatively agreed to take the brand to the Middle East, um, and we are on a, on a journey to, to build a brand that's about a lot more than just pizza. Um, early on in our life, actually about the time we were opening our fifth store, Allie and I sat down and we asked ourselves a question, you know, what would it take to uh, justify us investing all of the time and energy to manage another startup? Um, it takes an enormous commitment. And uh, at that time, we, we sat down and kind of defend, defined what success would look like for us. And Scott's right. We actually, we sat at our dining room table and we looked at each other and said, okay, if we, we know now we have a business that we could scale and we know that this thing has legs and it could do some amazing stuff, but we also know what it will take out of us if we're going to do this. Um, and we had an amazing conversation. We sat down and we, th we went back through time and thought of all the experiences that we've had, what has been the most meaningful? What are the moments that we, that we love the most? And with our professional experiences, we looked back and realized it was never about um, a particular product or a deal that was done or, or any amount of money that was made. Um, every single time that we went down memory, li memory lane, it was always about who are the people that we were able to work with and then who are the people that we were able to impact with what it was that we were doing? And by store five, um, we looked at each other and we said, the, the, the world doesn't need more pizza. We are well aware of that. Um, but the world needs more positive impacts. And something pretty amazing had been going on at Mod. Um, at the very beginning, we knew that we wanted to build a business that was different. Um, and we took some hiring risks early on with some people that we thought um, could use uh, a fresh start and needed somebody to believe in them, and we did that. And with each store that we opened, um, more amazing people got involved. And by store five, uh, the culture that had developed at Mod was uh, incredible to us. We were watching things happen that was really taking our breath away. Um, some of the most at-risk hires that we had made were the people that were um, pouring their heart and soul into the business that we were trying to build. And their work ethic was unbelievable. Uh, their commitment to, to the work of MOD and their, their uh, realization that they could use MOD as a platform to change their life uh, started to change the lives of those that they were working with or their customers or people in their community or their families. And we looked at that and we thought, okay, these guys have figured something out. And if we can keep opening mods where that is going on, that is something that we're interested in putting the blood, sweat, and tears into. 
um, we started to actually put you know, language around what it was that we were doing. Um, we were watching these mod squatters and how they were treating each other and how they were treating others. We started to say, well, they're just, they're spreading modness. That's what's going on when we open a store. Um, how they treat each other and what they do um, is really something quite special. And in fact, it was one of our mod squatters that he, he actually put the definition to paper and we printed it on all of our boxes a couple of years ago that says spreading modness. The definition is the ripple effect of simply doing the right thing. And we decided to, after store five on, we were very, very intentional that everything that we did with this business needed to serve a bigger purpose. And we, from that moment on, have, we've considered ourselves a purpose-led organization. We are focused on our people. Our business exists to be used as a platform to make a positive social impact. And we use that lens when we hire people. We use that lens when we do any sort of deal. Um, making sure that we can continue to impact in positive ways. Um, we developed something with our mod squad, you know, we continued to hire people that were, that were needing a second chance and at risk. And certain things developed at mod that helped to deal with that. Um, in particular, I think of something called the Bridge Fund that started organically, mods helping mods. A, one of our employees, his bike was stolen and his, his fellow mod squatters by the end of his shift had raised enough money to, to get him a bike so he could get home from work. And when we started to hear these kinds of stories, um, we decided we needed to, if we're gonna keep hiring people that need a job, that are deserving of a job, but are not really employable, then we're gonna have to help take care of them because they are at risk. So we now have a, 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 an incredible bridge fund that is there for mods helping mods, a, a mod that's in crisis. It's, it's incredible stories have come out of that. Um, we started to put together, we even have a little illustration that shows the journey at MOD is this, it's kind of a flywheel and we talk about if you can get somebody to gratitude, when they feel that deep sense of gratitude, the way they engage, the way they, the way they work, the way they want to give back, the way they want to pay it forward um, is something that we're very, very interested in and everything that we're doing now is really trying to amplify that. Um, for in the recent years, partnerships with other really incredible organizations in our communities. We now don't open a store, and we haven't for years, without partnering with a local nonprofit. Um, all around the country, every single store that opens, uh, we have a, a day that raises money for our bridge fund to take care of our mod squad, and then we have a day that raises money that will all go to a local charity that that mod squad has been able to choose and will partner with throughout the year. So these acts of spreading modness will go on all year long, and then we spotlight it uh, during our birthday in November. We decided how to celebrate years ago. We thought we're not gonna have a party, we're not gonna buy presents, but we want our mod squatters to have an opportunity to give back to their communities because they'd already shown us that that's really what they love to do. Uh, so every Thanksgiving week, we are massively spreading modness, partnering with tons of organizations. And this year, uh, because we've honed in on this idea that we're getting really good at hiring people, and we feed people, how can we take all of that to the next level? Um, our, our Spreading Modness campaign this year will be focusing on feeding people in a big way, partnering with an organization that um, has greatly inspired us called Generosity Feeds. And with them, the funds that we'll raise through sales that week, we think we'll be able to provide about half a million meals for kids that are hungry in the communities that we serve. So very excited about that kind of a partnership. And on the hiring front, there are these really neat you know, pilot programs that are going on, at-risk youth hiring initiatives that are going on around the country, and we're participating in some of those pilots, which we're really excited about. Um, we've been in active discussions with Fair Start here in our community. You all probably know the great work that they do, but the training and getting people off the streets and helping putting them back to work is something that we, we know we can help with because we, we hire lots of people. Um, and then, of course, a walking tour that we did not that long ago here with the Center for Community Engagement. Very inspiring, the possibility of uh, partnering and bringing our purpose to life in a huge way in a community store of some sort, which we'd like to do all around the country, uh, but we're, we're working to start it here and figure everything out that we can to bring the purpose to life in bigger ways and, and make bigger impacts. And from a business perspective, having a really strong culture that's inspired by a purpose uh, has a lot of advantages. Um, and you know, at the heart of it is, one, uh, an inspiration for my wife and I, Allie, to work as hard as we've worked to bring this thing to life. Um, every morning when we wake up, we think about what we're really trying to do with the business, and it's really not about the number of stores we're opening or the revenue or the other traditional metrics. It's really about how we feel when we hear the stories of the people that are being impacted. And then beyond that, the way that 
purpose um, binds the team together and provides a kind of a unifying um, mission for the organization uh, and the loyalty that that engenders and the commitment has been uh, fabulous. And then over time, as we can reveal that to our customers, we think that it becomes the primary source of our sustainable competitive advantage. Um, it's really hard to develop sustainable competitive advantage in retail, not to mention restaurants, not to mention pizza. And so for us, our strategy to do that is through culture and through purpose. So there is a business piece to this as well, which is about using it um, as a way of connecting our teams in a way that drives more loyalty, lower turnover, and also uh, over time connects with our customers. One of our challenges is how we communicate it in a way that's authentic and real and sincere and doesn't come across as marketing. Um, because when we jump into this and when we really make a commitment to doing it the right way, we do pay a tax. Um, paying our, our team members a living wage, which we've done uh, since the beginning, uh, providing everybody a free meal when they're on shift, um, which sounds like a small thing, but for many of our mod squatters, it's the best meal of the day, the day they'll have. Um, doing a lot of the things that we do in terms of training and development um, and a lot of the other programs we have for our team costs us money. And we estimate that it probably impacts in our business store level contribution as a primary metric of our health. And in our industry, to get to a 20% level store level contribution is, is, is kind of a, a, a really positive health metric. Um, we estimate that our purpose costs us three to 400 basis points, um, which is a big commitment. Now, we believe that over time, we'll get paid back through the loyalty of our team, the engagement that they show, the way that translates to lower turnover, higher productivity, um, better customer service, and that over time, as our customers learn that we're not just a cool pizza place that delivers a product in a new and innovative way, um, and at great value, but they, they understand there's something beyond that, that their loyalty will increase and our differentiation from our competitors will, will grow. Um, but we've had to surround ourselves with people who believe because we can't prove it. And we've raised over $150 million of equity, fortunately, from people who believe. Um, and we've, we've been very fortunate to find investors who are enlightened uh, and who believe in this type of a model, but it's not, uh, it's not for the faint of heart because you know, we know that our economics are gonna be burdened and that we believe over time we'll make that up, um, but we can't prove it, we have to believe. And one of the other advantages of this is the strength of the culture, and we ended with this picture because um, in the history of MOD, there have been a lot of high points and a lot of stories and a lot of things that have made Ali and I realize that what we're doing uh, is worth it. Um, but this picture in particular really brings to life um, uh, so much of what's important to us about MOD. These three MOD squatters, they've been with us for a long time, Corey, Sam, and Tony. Um, all three of them have spent a fair amount of time in prison. And Tony, for example, his last job before he learned to wash dishes at MOD was washing dishes um, behind bars. And the three of these guys are, without a doubt, um, quintessential mod culture carriers. And that had, we, we were, this interview, the interview that these three gave, we weren't in the room when they were being interviewed. We had no idea what they would say or what, what they did say until well, we a, read. There's an organization or a, a periodical called Franchise Times. Uh, we're not big franchisors. A small part of our business is franchised. But they came out to do a profile on us because they'd heard about our culture, they'd heard about what was going on at Mod. And so the, the editor of the magazine came and said, I'd like to spend two days in your business, but I don't want you guys to, uh, we just want to talk to people. And we're like, that's fabulous. And so she had uh, unconstrained access to the organization and she ended up spending a lot of time with these guys. And we had no idea what she was going to write. And then one day she said, I'm going to send you the cover of the upcoming, or of the upcoming um, edition. And when this showed up, these three were on the front cover of the magazine, which was, I, I'll, I'll say, probably the proudest moment that we've had because we know these guys, we know their stories. Uh, we love these guys. I mean, they are, they are mod, they, and they kind of personify what we're trying to get done. I think um, they actually helped show us the potential of mod very early on when we had that conversation at Store 5 around our dining room table. 
these guys had already been showing us what the potential was of really truly creating a place where you would welcome somebody in who needed somebody to believe in them, uh, nobody else had or nobody else would, um, and what they would do um, in gratitude for that opportunity. Uh, they, uh, they helped show us what this thing could become. And they are now, of course, the fiercest protectors of, of the business. And, and the, uh, the, the headline on the front cover of the, of the magazine was, Don't Mess With Mod. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the power of a fiercely loyal culture. And you know the, the three guys on the front cover were all looking pretty tough. And, and you meet these guys, they can look pretty tough. Yeah. And, uh, um, and then in the inside, there were lots of pictures of them smiling. And, um, but uh, it just reminded us that we, th this, the business and the culture has never been about us, but it's certainly not about us now. It is really about them and their cohort and their peers. And um, you know, one of the one of the positives of building a business that's got a strong culture is that over time it defends itself. And um, I think these guys are great examples of that. The other thing to mention, uh, each year after about store five, when we would get together as a group and we would get together all of our general managers and. When we were starting to grow this thing, we would stop each year and think, this is really hard. It's taken a lot out of a lot of people. We don't need to do it. We've got a nice little local business that we, it's making impact. And, and, and we would share with the people that had joined us, you know, listen, we don't need to be building anything big. Shall we slow it down? Or, and the most vocal supporters um, of you know, wanting to grow would be people like these three and others that had similar opinions uh, or whose life had been changed. Their view was, we need to open more places like this in other parts of the country. More people need to get these opportunities. We want to help provide that for people. Uh, we need to keep going. And that's been very motivating for, uh, for us when we get really tired. <laughs> I think we've run a little bit over, but. Okay, well, thank you very much. I'll invite our panelists to come up and find a seat. Great presentation, thank you. Um, so let me, uh, let me do the introductions on the panelists and then we can get to their questions. So joining us first is Andrea Nordstrom. She's a uh, senior marketing major with a minor in entrepreneurship and innovation. And she has lived on three continents, worked on three continents, and traveled to six. So her passions include volunteering abroad, learning new languages, and dancing. And after graduating this December, she will go to London to take a marketing position oh. that she has there. Uh, and then next to her is Chad McKay. Chad is um, CEO of Fire and Vine Hospitality, which is the operating company that manages the El Gaucho family of restaurants and the Inn at El Gaucho. He joined El Gaucho and his father and founder, Paul McKay, in 2003. His primary responsibilities include developing the, people, the company's people and structure and continuing to foster the El Gaucho legacy of service. He's been very active in the community, serving on the boards of the Washington State Hospitality Association and Visit Seattle, and previously served on the Washington State Tourism Advisory Board, the Washington State Tourism Commission, and the Seattle Sports Commission and he has a undergraduate business degree from Seattle U. <laughs> and then uh, last, furthest from me, is uh, Serbi Saxena. She is a student in our MS in Finance program. She is working as an intern in the Ramp Up program within our Innovation and Entrepreneurship Center, which is an initiative to help small businesses in the Yesler Collaborative Neighborhoods and trying to work with Maude on some of the things that were talked about earlier. She has previously worked in a bank and is a co-founder of a wealth management firm. She grew up in Corba, India and has an undergraduate degree in biotechnology from the National Institute of Technology in Raper, India. So those are our panelists. Andrea, you are first up on the stage, so you get to go first. All right. Um, yeah, it is on. Just making sure, guys. Um, you mentioned that you guys created a crisis fund and that it was originally created because someone had their bike stolen. Um, when did you decide after that that it would be a good idea to create the fund? How is it replenished? And do all of your stores have it? Or is, which one did it start in and why? 
you want to go ahead? Sure. So um, what, what you're referring to is the, what we call the bridge fund. And uh, the original inspiration behind it was mods helping mods. What we found is that informally mods were helping each other and we wanted to get behind it and create some um, continuity and, and longevity to it. Um, and so the way it's funded right now is um, every employee has an opportunity to have a payroll deduction and it can be a dollar a pay period or more uh, as a way for them to give back. Um, every time we open a store, one of our training days, um, we open to the public. Uh, it's, it's called the Bridge Day and it's intended to be a day where they're still, the team's still training. Everything is half off and 100% of what we raise goes to the bridge fund. Um, and then we have um, you know, other kind of periodic ways of raising money. To put it in context, this year we'll raise um, about $200,000 for the bridge fund and next year it'll be about four, uh, 350 to 400,000, we believe. Um, uh, we, did, we do other, like I said, periodic things. This year when um, uh, Hurricane Harvey hit Houston, we had some uh, we have 21 stores in Houston, and we had a lot of team members that were negatively impacted. So the bridge fund really kicked into action. And we had a day a week after the, the hurricane where 10% of all of our proceeds on a, a given day were put into, uh, half of it went to the Red Cross to support um, the, the victims of Hurricane Harvey, and half went into the bridge fund. So we raised something like $90,000 uh, uh, on one day for that. And, it goes, uh, it, it, it's, it's um, managed internally. Uh, there's a rotating group of uh, mod squatters who are on a, a committee. It's all confidential. It's all confidential. People um, apply for help and it's generally a grant, sometimes a loan. Um, and it's all meant, to, it's not, we joke that, you know, if, um, if you missed a shift and you're, you know, you're running low and you can't go out, it, the bridge fund's not the place to come. But, um, if you, uh, you know, if, if you have a family medical emergency or a crisis. And the um, stories that come out of um, people that have been uh, helped by the Bridge Fund is pretty inspiring. And we're, we're graduating the Bridge Fund over the, as we head into 18, to add another component to it, which we're kind of referring to as the Journey Fund, which is as we raise more money and we can now start putting money, not just behind getting people out of crisis, but to help them on their journey mm -hmm. with whatever it is, educational assistance or, or other developmental opportunities. Jack? Uh, let's see if this works, yep. Um, you touched on the check second chance philosophy and I'd love to learn a little bit more about that and the struggle that you have on the telling that externally versus the internal. I know it wins the hearts of your people, um, but a lot of people I know don't know about mm -hmm. what you do and how do you bridge that um, and not make it a, a marketing gimmick but yeah. of heart we we really did not talk about it at all for the first i mean many years actually because the very nature of it we thought it just didn't feel right to talk about it we had an experience gosh i wonder how many years ago it was it was uh december early december and i think it was king five wanted to do a piece on, they had heard through somebody that uh, we had hired some people that um, you know had been incarcerated and they wanted to, to talk about it. And our initial reaction, well, of course not. Um, but a couple of our folks that had, that they, that they wanted to t tell their story, um, you know, we, we talked to them about it and we said, listen, they're interested in talking about um, what's happening at MOD and um, but we fear that they're gonna to wanna to talk about your past. And so we want you to know you don't need to do that. We don't expect you to. And it was unbelievable. There were five, five uh, mod squatters and all five of them said, we wanna tell our story. We wanna talk about our past. We want other people to know that if they've been through what we've been through, there is hope for them. And more importantly, we want other businesses to understand that there is an untapped workforce of you know, potentially incredibly contributors, <laughs> you know, these, these amazing people. And they wanted to do the piece and we were scared. Mm -hmm. And the piece was, it, it was well done and they did tell their story. And from that point on, bits had come out, but we've also been very intentional to say, you know, for us, what we see, it, it's the second chances, um, it, it comes in a lot of different forms. You know, there, a lot of um, people that we've hired have had health issues or have developmental um, issues that, that have made it hard for them to have 
the, the work, uh, the jobs that they wanted. Um, so we've been uh, wanting to share more of those stories, and we start always internally. We've never done the, we're not, we're not pitching any of these stories to anybody. Um, what we realized years ago was that the only way this was gonna feel okay for us is if a mod squatter is telling his or her story, and in fact, that is how um, some of that messaging came about. And so, You asked a great question, though, yeah. is how do, we, how do you reveal that to customers without it coming across as being self-serving? And we're, we struggle with that yeah. because when people learn, they're like, you should tell the story, and we're like, well, we're not quite sure how to tell it. So we've started to do a couple of things. In, in every new store, we have just a little statement that we put somewhere and it's generally hand-painted, and it says, uh, we make pizza to serve people. We call it spreading modness, welcome to mod. And it's meant to be kind of thought-provoking. Um, and then in a few other stores, we've played with things like, our, our graphics team has come up with this statement that says, like right in the middle of the restaurant, this is not a pizza place. Um, mm -hmm. And these things are just meant to be provocative so that hopefully it starts a conversation so that We'd much rather have a mod squatter say, oh, listen, let me, talk to you, let me tell you my story as opposed to reading it on a poster or in a, in a pamphlet. When we landed on we make pizza so we can serve people, we call it spreading modness. We did that when we were opening in the UK because we were trying to figure out how do we tell people in the UK what we're about. But the other message that came out of that, um, that time period of what, what it's sort of a mission that we're gonna put out there for people, it is at the end where you pick up your pizza it says, if you don't love your pizza, let us know. We're all about second chances. And we put it there, and it's now in, in every store, and it's, we consider it kind of a loaded statement. Most people will think that, okay, fine, I get to remake my pizza for free, but what we're trying to get out there in our own way is, listen, the second chances, yeah. My question is uh, basically uh, as uh, we all know that Mod Pizza is a for-profit, and yet it has a bigger purpose of social impact behind it. So was there a situation or time when somebody told you or you came across a situation where after your study you realized that there could be a difficult, uh, you could be in a difficult place where for-profit and social impact won't go together, mm -hmm. and you still believed on what you were doing and you pursued with it? Yes, and uh, this has been a journey, and we, you know, we've said that we've got a little bit of it figured out, but we have so much more to figure out, and, and uh, fortunately, Ali and I are committed to this. We think about this as kind of our life's work, as something that's inspiring to us, that we get a lot of gratification out of um, taking on the combined challenge of building a company that's sustainable and successful is hard, um, and then combining that with making a positive social impact adds another layer of complexity. Um, but it's that piece that really gets us excited. It gets the team excited. It's, it really makes people feel good. Like Ali said, you know, the world doesn't need another soulless pizza chain. And um, there have been a lot of moments where we've had to pause and, and um, you know, either when we were adding things that we thought were integral to our, our purpose and we would look at the economic impact and we would say, I, you know, this is, this is tough. Um, but we, we've committed from the outset, that's why we're doing this. Um, and so therefore to compromise on it um, just doesn't feel right. And, and there's a bigger, you know, if you, if you were to zoom out and say, well, you know, what's your bigger objective? It's hopefully to prove to other entrepreneurs that you can do both and that if you have the courage to do both over time and you do have to, you know, you do have to manage through the, you have to get across the river. Um, once you get across, you'll end up with a stronger business that's more defensible and that has more longevity to it because of that connection with the customers and with the employees. But man, there's, there's a period of risk where, it, you know, it would be easy to say, well, let's take that tax off in the short term because, you know, we, want, we have to accomplish whatever we need to. But... Um, yeah, we, we haven't wavered from it. Now, uh, I've, we've said many times that if this was our first entrepreneurial venture, mm -hmm. I don't think we would have had that courage. Um, but because we've done it a few times before and, and we, we didn't need to do this to pay the mortgage and it was really something that we were you know, inspired, that's helped us. But having done it, we, we turn around and say, gosh, we wish we'd have known we would have done it the same way with our other two companies. Something that's been really fun, though, along the way, realizing there are 
a lot of really amazing companies that are thinking this way more and more every day. You know, and so for us, we've been able to start to really pay attention and notice and see. I mean, I think about you know, Tom's Shoes. The CEO of Tom's Shoes is is on our board, and understanding that you know many people think that that's a nonprofit. You know, that they're giving shoes away, and um, to start to pay attention to who else is thinking. You know, can we? do really, really well as a business so that we can do, you know, be a force for good in the world. Um, this, this one organization that I think I mentioned that we're partnering with for our Spreading Modness Week this year, Generosity Feeds, we had a really fun meeting with him early on um, when we were realizing, what they do is quite incredible. You, you, you it takes a chunk of money and then you have these feeding um, events where you m make meals. So in two or three hours, you can create 10,000 meals with, say, you get 80 people together, and it's a production line, and it's highly nutritious, um, beans, rice, spices. And then you can load up a, a food bank with these, with these meals or go into a backpack program because they fit really nicely into a kid's backpack. And so he's, he's creating these great feeding events in various mod um, communities where we can then feed a lot more people. They're not eating pizza, but they're, we're, we're, we're kind of amplifying um, uh, our feeding efforts. But when we had our first big meeting with him, at the end of the discussion, it was really cool because he said, he said, you know, I like to think, you know, he's a, he's a nonprofit, it's a nonprofit, and he said, I'm a nonprofit, but I really think like a business, and you guys are, you're a business, but you have a heart of a nonprofit. And he said, if more partnerships could exist out there like that, um, the world would be a better place. And, and that's kind of what we've been trying to do on little level, you know, store by store, each store partnering with local organizations where you can match that up, you know, the head of a business and the heart of a And, and Ali's mentioned this. There's, there's a lot more conversation taking place about this combination of, you know, companies being conscious of the impact they're having on their communities and on society. And there's a lot of great discussions going on now. And we've been inspired by a lot of companies over time. We spent time at Starbucks. You know, there's a long list of companies. I'll tell you, there's another great company locally, and I'm, I'm going to embarrass someone who's sitting right there, Jim Senegal. We talk about it all um, the time. We talk about all the time that, you know, and listen, we do get some credit for the things we're doing. Um, you know, Costco is a company that I think has been living a lot of these same values from the beginning and has never asked for any credit for it. Um, I had this strange experience where I was able to be on Jim Cramer on CNBC, and they were, he was asking about this stuff, and then off camera we were talking, and... He, all he wanted to do was talk about Costco and, and Jim Sinegal, and his comment was, and by the way, everybody wants to get on Jim Cramer to tell their story, to build their brand awareness, and he goes, I'm always calling him, trying to get him on the show, and he always says no. Um, and I was like, well, there's a guy who's, you know, doing it because it's the right thing to do, not because he's trying to get credit for it. Um. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that you partner with charities and nonprofits. We all know there are many worthy charities and nonprofits out there. How do you choose which charities and nonprofits to partner with? It's a great question, and uh, we ha we've had to think about that. Uh, each year, we've partnered with more and more, and so we've, we've really been honing in naturally our mod squad. The whole idea for us was we wanted our mod squad to be the ones that were doing the giving and engaging and helping. So um, naturally, they tended to identify um, organizations that um, helped, you know, get with housing, you know, people that, you know, shelters and, and places people needed to stay, and, and food. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and youth at risk um, to have tended to be kind of the natural focuses of, of, our, of our employees. And so we've been responding to that, and we generally try to, you know, stay, stay focused on it. But, but honestly, we kind of leave it to our, our stores to understand in your community, what, it, what are the needs and what do you care about and where is the help that, you know, you need to be providing and we, we listen to them. But we now have a dedicated resource. We have, you know, a, a gal that's been with us from the very beginning. She is our director of community engagement and, and she spends all of her time working with the Mod Squad to make sure that we're engaging with the community um, and developing the partnerships that make sense for Mod. And, and, and we're honing in on, you know, it, it, t typically, you know, it's, it's youth at risk, it's families at risk, um, food-related issues, and, yeah. Thank you. Um, I love your, your line that culture eats strategy for breakfast, and it's very easy to copy a concept, very difficult to ever copy a culture that needs to be grown, tended to, and developed. 
Uh, you didn't talk about this today, but I, I've heard you before talk about this idea of wide boulevard boulevards with yeah, high, high curves. curves. But I'd love to know as an example of where someone something got close and when something went over. Mm -hmm. And yeah. what did you do? Uh, it's a great question. It's one of our uh, values that we talk about. We don't. We're an organization that, even though we're a retailer, we don't actually have a lot of rules, um, and we try to manage by principles and. And wide boulevards, high curbs is one of them. And, and uh, there's a story that we tell occasionally that kind of brings it to life, which is uh, Corey, who was one of the gentlemen on the, on the screen, um, he'd come out of prison. Uh, he'd been with us for about a year, and he was promoted to a general manager. And it was a big deal because um, he didn't believe that anybody would ever give him the keys to a store and basically say, you're in charge, we, we trust you. Um, and about three months after he'd become general manager, he lost a $3,500 deposit. And um, uh, of course, that's the moment when a lot of people say, we told you so, you can't trust that type of person with that type of background in a cash business. And so we sat down with Corey and we asked him what happened and he, uh, he shared that he made a mistake and he lost it. And we looked him in the eye and we said, we believe you. And uh, he said, I'll pay you back. And we said, listen, you don't need to pay us back. Uh, not only did he pay us back, but over the last six years, seven years since that happened, he's paid us back a million fold by virtue of the impact he's made in the business. Another individual about the same time who was an assistant general manager with the same background um, was being promoted to general manager. And um, when he was cashing out of the last night when he was at the store before he took on his new store, um, the, uh, the, the till was $60 short. And he, motivated by not wanting to have the company be short, he took $60 out of the tips for the employees and put it in to make up. And okay, he was trying to do the right thing, but when he was confronted and asked, did you do that, he said no. And he was fired, um, over $60. Um, and it was, it was just one of those things of, he crossed the curb. And he could have explained it, and he, you know, we would have had his back. We talk about the fact that at Mod, um, if you stay inside the curbs, you'll make mistakes, um, um, but you won't be wrong, and we've got your back. Um, but if you jump a curb, you're, 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 you've decided to leave. And um, um, so that's a story we tell to kind of bring it to life, $3,500 versus $60. Um, but it was more the fact that Corey... Um, was honest about it and owned it, and the other individual um, uh, wasn't honest. By the way, we need to update that slide. I, everybody's, you know, cult, cult, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Which is, by the way, Peter Drucker. We, He's, yeah, <laughs> we, we love that. But I just heard recently in some article where it says, actually, c culture eats everything for breakfast. And I think we need to update the slide because it's we believe that. <laughs> You uh, mentioned about the community stores, and uh, there are many retail stores who do have their community stores. So I would like to know from you, what is the vision of community store for you oh. is, and how would it differentiate from your normal store? Yeah. It's, it's a great it's, question, yeah, and work by the in way, progress. we've been working with the folks at Seattle U and a bunch of others to try to figure that out. The feasibility study, um, yeah. Part of the answering the question, how do you bring the purpose to life in a way that's real and authentic and it doesn't feel like marketing, one of the answers to that is, well, just go do it. And so this idea of building a store, and maybe over time, multiple stores, where the focus and the mission of that store is really to engage with and give back to the community, um, is probably is one of the ways that we think we can do that. And so we've had conversations with Seattle U about partnering in the Yesler Terrace to build a store that's really about and for the community. It's a underserved, underprivileged community, and we, we do two things well. We employ people, and we give them opportunities, and we develop them, we believe in them. Um, you know, we have this saying that your past may well describe you, but it doesn't need to define you. So employing people and giving them opportunities and training is one piece, and the other piece is we feed people. Um, and so those will be the two platforms or pillars that we'll use to try to make an impact. And we have some ideas for all the things that we can do in that store. Um, but it's really, we've got a, um, as an alley and several others are really driving it, but partner, we're looking at partnering with organizations. One of the other things we don't want to do is 
fill in a need that's already being served. You know, we want to try to address needs that aren't. So, or pretend start. like we're experts in an area that's not our. We're, we're, if we're employing people and feeding people, you know, the, the, you get organizations like Fair Start in places that know. I mean, their training programs are just exceptional, and so that, yeah, that's something that gets us really excited. And format like the test fits and the things that we've been playing with for the community store, thinking about ways in which you can increase certain spaces so that it can be a. There could be training facilities there, but then also community gathering spaces, and it's really been really fun to think about. Because another yeah. key theme in our business is it's about family, it's about community, it's about getting together, and again, trying to amplify that value in a place like the Esler Terrace, and having a place where kids can have a you know after school drop in, and and having um, you know youth activities or you know. Um, job training and mm -hmm. just a, a range of things and how it all comes to life and all the things that may be done, we're not quite sure. We're also playing with an idea of doing a similar, similarly motivated store in Pioneer Square. Um, uh, and we're working on that as a project as well, which would be a little bit different, but kind of have the same. And that elements purpose. of it that you can almost take out little capsule el elements from a full-blown community store, which we would view what Yesler Terrace as. And where can you plug those into other stores to make sure that you're using each store as much as a platform to make an impact as possible? Great, thank you. Sure. Thank you. So we have a few minutes left for questions from the audience. So there will be a microphone in each aisle and um, you can raise your hand if you have a question and we'll try to bring you the microphone. Yeah. So here in the middle, Jeff. <laughs> in the middle there. Thank you. So my understanding is that when you were working in the UK, you sold your company to Starbucks. And one of Starbucks' biggest goals is to create community centers through their stores where, yes, they sell coffee, but the goal is to have people be able to come from the community and build everything. And my understanding is you're also working to build communi community stores. Is your goal for the future, excuse me, is your goal for the future to build something more along the lines of full service, or what exactly are you looking to build from a pizza company to community engagement? Well, um, I, I don't think that we'll ever change kind of the core of our model, you know, being a fast, casual format. There's lots of things that we're looking at doing it, evolving it and making it more relevant to consumers, whether or not that's a lot of the digital engagement um, and mobile ordering and drive-through and you know, there's a bunch of stuff we're looking at. But ultimately, I think one of the key elements of our value proposition is that people still want to get out and meet someplace. And, you know, we joke, when we were growing up, there were places where you could go and have the after-season, you know, soccer team party or the kids' birthday party or... And those places kind of disappeared. Um, you know, what, you're not going to really go do that in a McDonald's or a Chipotle even or... And, you know, there was a place in our community, Shakey's and Gino's Pizza. <laughs> Those are the two spots and everybody... Yeah. And um, now people think of Mod as that place and we're kind of filling a need that wasn't being filled before. And um, that's a really powerful part of our, our model is being a place where the community can come out and get together and... and uh, it's really attractive for the kids, but you know the folks, the parents are also happy, and you know so it really kind of brings together not only the community but also different generations and demographics. When our stores have the ability to have a community table or a section that you can close off, we get super excited. A great example of that is our Bellevue Way store was our second store. It's our local store. We love it. The parking is a disaster, and it's pretty small. So when the teams would show up or our groups, and we've been part of many of those. It's really tricky. You're, you're really impacting the other customers, and it's hard to have an isolated event. But we opened another um, Bellevue over by Bellevue Overlake area near where our support center is, out um, out past 100 and almost 100, and, yeah, between 148 and 156. A lot of parking. But what's really great about that store is there's actually a section where there you can make a big community table. You can slide the barn doors, 
you know, groups can be in there, they can have their events, their parties, but they're not impacting everybody else, or you can just open it up and everything circulates. But it's really nice to be able to have a space that can be flexible that way so that when people do want to gather, but we also want MOD to be a place that you are comfortable to go on your own. And, and so it's trying to accommodate all of that. I think the community gathering part, I don't think you need to radically change what we're doing. I think you just need to look for more spaces that have, you know, nice community table options and that seems to do the trick. My name is Aaron Rose. Uh, I serve on the advisory board here at the uh, Center for Global Business. Um, two quick questions. One, uh, what risk factors do you focus most on with your business? And two, whether it's cloud computing, point of sale software, mobile ordering, but what does technology mean to your business? Oh uh, uh, good questions. Yeah. So um, the risk factors, how much time do we have? Mm -hmm. um, Chipotle. <laughs> um, Food safety is a big one. Um, all you have to do is just read the recent stories around Chipotle. You know, and Chipotle is a great company, and they they got caught up. Um, we, you know, at the end of the day, we have 15 to 20, uh, 15 to 30 employees in a store. And any one time, there's probably five to ten of them on on uh, uh, um, at work. And we've got lots of people coming into the stores, and so. There's interaction and engagement, and, and lots of good stuff happens, but some bad stuff can happen. And so that's always a concern, because we have 265 locations. Um, it's 6.30, it's 9.30 on the East Coast. They're all operating right now. And so there are people walking around and going into the back room, and, and so you worry about stuff happening, particularly when you know we, we do employ people with, with um, different backgrounds, and so that's the other thing that we get freaked out about is, will that come back to bite us at some point? And we we're very thoughtful about that, but but we do um, run a risk. Um, you know, interestingly enough, we have an advisory board member um, who runs uh, Dunkin' Donuts, and his number one, the thing he's number most focused on is data security. Um, which is another one of those issues that can really be a game changer for a company like ours if it goes wrong. Um, gosh, there's, you can just keep going on. on Stressing us out. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and technology is, is really important. We're not a technology company, mm. and we've had, we're actually hiring a, a head of technology right now, so we've had a lot of conversations about this. We need to use technology really uh, intelligently to make our business more efficient so it runs more smoothly, and there's, so that's a lot of back of house, a lot of infrastructure type stuff, to make the employee journey more efficient and, and so they can focus on the most important things, and then over time to use it as an enabler for our customers. Right. And that's you know, so that they can use us in more efficient ways. Mobile ordering, maybe some kiosks or some tablets in the stores. Um, we're playing with, um, uh, you know, there's all, you just, you, you start layering stuff in, geofencing and how it, so there's, I mean, technology is a super important part of our future, but we're not a technology company, so uh, we, we, we don't want to get too carried away. And we also have to manage GNA, and so there's a little bit of a, okay, well, are we going to put that extra dollar into technology or into our people? And, you know, at MOD, that generally goes towards the people, so it's a little bit of a, it's an interesting one. Although we just, I just went through um, GNA budgeting for the next, number of years, and I'll tell you, our, our technology budget is getting pretty big. Um, for a company that, you know, when we started, I thought, oh, technology, it's our point of sale, and it's, there's a lot more to it than that. Um, we just implemented SAP, uh, and we now have to implement a similar system at, a, at the store level, um, and gosh, if I told you what the annual licensing costs for these stupid systems are, just to, and I keep saying, we sell pizza, I mean, let's try to keep it simple, but. That's important. I mean, I think for every, Domino's is probably the best example in our category of a company that has transformed itself, and it truly is. 60% of their employees in their support center are, are in their technology team. Um, yeah. Well, with those two questions, we're gonna have to bring this to a close, so then, let's thank uh, Al and Scott. <laughs> Woo! Again, uh, we thank our speakers and also thank all you for being with us and we'll uh, see you November 7th is the next uh, speaker.
Nick Hanauer. <laughs>